Uh, hello, friends. So today I'll be briefly talking on the role of steroids in uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. So I'm sure as an intensivist, uh, you would be encountering this practice where steroids are started for GBS along with IVIG by the specialist neurologists. So I was just pondering to understand whether there is really a good role for steroids in Guillain-Barre. Uh, so it is good for all the intensive care trainees and intensivists to understand whether there is any science at all. So up front, if I ask the question if there is role of steroids in GBS, possibly the answer is no. So there is possibly no role of steroids. There may be a distinctive subset of patients where there is a scientific plausibility of its benefit. But having said that, there is no strong evidence uh, backing the routine usage of steroids as a standard of care in GBS. So IV immunoglobulin remains the standard over plasma exchange, which we discussed in the previous video. And adding steroids to IVIG at this point of time, there doesn't seem to be a robust evidence backing that practice is what we could make out from the available signs. But the practice of using steroids along with IV immunoglobulin seems to be widely prevalent. So we'll just look into what is the evidence and I will leave it at that. So just to understand, there are no new trials with the usage of steroids along with IV immunoglobulins uh, to look at its benefits since 2009. So most trials have stopped at around 2004-2005. So if you look collectively, there are about six trials looking at the role of steroids in Guillain-Barre syndrome. So we'll look into uh, the details of, very briefly on the details of these trials. Uh, so six trials incorporating around 587 patients. And uh, IV steroids uh, usage in Guillain-Barre syndrome, there are about two trials uh, which has looked at uh, usage of IV steroids. So uh, the IV steroids that have been used is 500 milligrams methylprednisolone for five days. So this is the practice I'm sure uh, is prevailing in many places where this is added as an adjunct uh, to immunoglobulins. Uh, so, so, this, so this is the dosage that they have used. So these are two trials. So if you look the dates of these trials, the first trial came in Lancet way back in 1993. Okay, so this trial, there's no point discussing about this trial where they've used steroids with plasma exchange and compared with patients who got plasma exchange alone. And uh, there was absolutely no difference. So this practice currently is not uh, uh, prevalent at this point of time because plasma exchange is not the first choice at this point of time. So we wouldn't discuss. But even in that, they did not show any difference between uh, the steroids and plasma exchange versus plasma exchange. So the second trial was the much uh, talked about trial uh, and which is referenced by practitioners who use steroids is this Danish trial, which came in Lancet in 2004, where they use steroids with IV immunoglobulins. Okay, so IV immunoglobulins is the standard of care. So to that, they added steroids. So this is the second trial, which we'll talk about. And there was this meta-analysis, uh, which came in Cochrane. Uh, so where they really looked into all these six trials and they have dissected out, it was done by Hughes et al. So, and if you Google, you will see this Cochrane, which is around 78 page document, which is very extensively deliberated on the usage of steroids and its uh, possible benefits. So we'll talk about this particular trial, which came in 2004 by the Denmark group. And this is the most sort of a reference trial when it comes to the usage of steroids. So the title of this is effect of methylprednisolone when added to standard treatment with intravenous immunoglobulin for Guillain-Barre syndrome randomized trial. So here they used IVIG for all the patients, 0.4 grams per kg per day for five days, which is anyway the standard uh, any patient would get. Along with this, they used 500 mg methylprednisolone for five days. And this methylprednisolone had to be instituted within two days after initiation of IV immunoglobulins. And they compared with the group, which got only IV immunoglobulins. So they had 233 patients, 116 patients got IV immunoglobulin with methylprednisolone and 117 patients got only IV immunoglobulins. And as you would see, most of the endpoints, clinical endpoints, they would look at the disability score. So improvement in the disability score. 
So it tended to happen in 68% of methylprednisolone. So there was a signal indicating that there may be benefit of methylprednisolone, 68% versus 56%, and odds ratio was 1.68, and it did not attain statistical significance. So after this, they did a age adjustment. So here they took two groups, less than 50 and more than 50, and then they adjusted for the age to possibly try to attain statistical significance. When they adjusted for the age, then they could attain statistical significance in the methylprednisolone group where the odds of improvement seem to be better. And if you see the confidence interval, it just about attained statistical significance of points. So there was a statistical tweaking with adjustment of the age that happened less than 50, more than 50 to attain statistical significance. So this is the only trial to date we have which points towards possible benefit of adding methylprednisolone to IV immunoglobulins. And this is even uh, not as a primary endpoint, but the, after adjusting for the age, they could attain this statistical significance. So after this, there was a lot of work that happened from by this guy, Hughes et al. Uh, so he did a very detailed, comprehensive Cochrane review was done, uh, taking all six trials and looking at various endpoints, and it's a 78-page document, so if you're interested, you can go through it, but I'll just summarize the findings. So here, the clinical endpoint, they looked at change in disability. So disability score is from zero to six, so six being the worst. So as you see, uh, they looked at change in disability over four weeks, and they looked at six studies which looked at change in disability over four weeks in 587 patients. So control group, it was minus 0.89. So if it becomes positive, then the disability score is actually getting worse. So in steroid group, it was 0.36 lower, which means they had a, a worser sort of an outcome with the use of steroids. So the, the sort of a uh, comments that you could make is the steroid group had a worser outcome although it did not attain statistical significance. This is the systematic review or meta-analysis taking all the studies when they looked at this. Then they looked at change in the disability from zero to six or four weeks with only oral steroids. So they first they took all the patients and they looked at it. Then they looked at the patients who got only oral steroids. There were four studies which looked at the role of oral steroids, including 120 patients. And even there, the steroid group the disability change did not fare better. It was 0.82 lower, which means the steroid group did not do well and uh, they had a worse outcome, although it did not attain statistical significance even there. And then they looked at IV steroids. As you know, there are two studies so uh, which we spoke about. So one is by the Dutch group and the previous one was by the guillain barre syndrome trial group, which came in 1993. They took these two studies, 467 patients, and when they took these only IV steroid uh, studies, they found that the steroid group performed better because the results of this were influenced by this Danish study, which was a positive study, which showed that patients on steroids did better when they adjusted for the age. So in this, when they only took IV steroids, the steroid group tended to do better even here it did not attain statistical significance. The so NSS P is non-significant, even in this. And then they looked at patients who improved by more than or equal to one grade. So improvement in the disability grade by one grade at the end of four weeks, they looked at five studies which had looked at improvement in one grade in 567 patients. Even here, if you see, 543 <clears throat> had improvement by one grade in control group in 1,000 patients and 586 improved by one grade in 1,000 patients. And even there, it did not attain statistical significance, which means all the endpoints, they looked at change in disability at four weeks with the overall group, no improvement. With in fact, steroid group tended to do worse, but none of them attained statistical significance. And change in disability score with oral steroids also, steroid group did bad, but did not attain statistical significance. When you take only IV steroids, which was influenced by the Danish study, steroid group tended to do better, but even then it did not attain statistical significance. And improvement of more than one grade in four weeks, again, there was no difference between the steroid group and the control group. So let's look at the death or disability at one year. 
So there were three studies which looked at death or disability at one year, including 491 patients. So 92 out of 1,000 patients either died or had severe disability at one year in the control group. And steroid, if you see, there was a slight inclination towards higher number in steroid group, 139 out of 1,000 either died or had severe disability at one year. But again, there, it did not attain statistical significance. As you see, the confidence interval is 0.91 to 2.5. So it did not attain uh, statistical significance there. Uh, so when they looked at adverse events, which means patients who develop diabetes needing insulin, clearly there were two studies which looked at the adverse effects, 467 patients. And as you see, steroid group significantly had higher risk of diabetes needing insulin, 124 out of 1,000 compared to 56. And here it attained statistical significance. And they looked at patients who developed hypertension. So two studies looked at the patients who developed hypertension, 251 patients. Surprisingly, hypertension appeared more in the control group. And even that attained statistical significance, 117 out of 1,000 in control group developed hypertension as compared to 18 in 1,000 in steroid group, and that attained statistical significance. So for this, uh, authors could not ascertain what could be the reasoning as to why control group had higher occurrence of hypertension. So this is a very comprehensive data at this point of time we have from Hughes et al. So if you do Google search, the only articles that come are this Cochrane review and the Lancet study. So, and this particular Cochrane review has very exhaustively dissected out all the studies and have done a very comprehensive comparison. So what we could decipher is the oral steroids, overall steroids did not really make any difference with regards to outcomes. And even IV steroids, although it appeared in Danish study by adjusting the age, it had some benefit. But in this meta-analysis, it did not attain statistical significance. And if at all, steroids will possibly increase the adverse events. And deaths also, number-wise, it seems to be little more at the end of one year in steroids, although that also did not attain statistical significance. So all the studies, as I said, are prior to 2004-2005. There are no studies after that. So there were two very good uh, editorials that came after this Lancet study and after this Cochrane. Uh, so one editorial came by Hughes and another uh, editorial came by Rossi et al., where they have debated again and in the editorial, they have very strongly contested against each other that possibly steroids do not have a very favorable or beneficial role. Albeit, Rossi has made a very interesting uh, sort of a observation. So as per in the editorial by Rossi, which I can suggest that all our trainees read. So GBS, there are two types, as you would know, demyelinating and axonal uh, degeneration. So in uh, in axonal degeneration, there are antibodies. There are high levels of antibody titers against this ganglocyte GM1. So there are a lot of antibody titers. And in Rossi, he published a small paper and presented a paper where they did a study in 16 patients where 10 had axonal degeneration and 6 had demyelinating. And what they found was high titers of uh, yeah, and antibodies against the ganglocyte GM1 was present in these axonal degenerated patients uh, and they did not find this high titers of antibodies against GM1 in the demyelinating guillain barre syndrome. And in these patients where they had high titers of antibodies against GM1, they found the Rossi's were, interpretation was the steroids were beneficial or helpful because they used IV immunoglobulins with methylprednisolone in all these five patients where there were high titers of anti-GM1 uh, antibodies and all these patients improved at the end of one month. So this is the debate or uh, sort of a contest in the editorial that, uh, that, that came as a narrative. So all in all, at the end of it, I think my take is possibly if we are looking at the core signs uh, to substantiate usage of steroids, there is no evidence because if you look at six trials which has looked at the role of steroids comprehensively, even in meta-analysis, steroids doesn't seem to have any benefit uh, when it is added to IV immunoglobulins. But if someone really uh, uses steroids, then possibly substantiation could be made in a distinct subset of patients 
where this uh, anti gb gm1 antibody status are high in axonal degeneration it may have some benefit and possibly from an intensive care perspective uh, i would subscribe that one could think of using steroids especially when you uh, when we have done this and possibly where we have good infection control practices one to one nursing and uh, and the risk benefit ratio of steroids increasing the risk of infection or causing critical uh, illness myoneuropathy has to be borne in mind before contemplating on use of steroids because we have clearly understood gps they tend to take a long time for recovery to happen or mode of icu we looked into the last video that at least they take up to 2 months to get discharged from icu and up to 1 year to resume their normal functional ability so given all this uh, to use steroids one has to really have a very strong substantiation maybe one should possibly think of doing anti ganglioside antibodies look at its titer if it is high or axonal degeneration maybe in this subset a short course of steroid especially in icus where your infection risk are in an acceptable levels it should be used suppose if you have an icu where your vap rates are more than 18 per 1000 ventilator days or cr base air rates are more than 4 per 1000 catheter days or utis are more than 6 per catheter days definitely one should avoid because or comprehensively there there is no strong substantiation for usage of steroids in guillain barre syndrome because for us the worry is more delayed weaning because of critical illness myoneuropathy and any infection further prolongs their weaning process and uh, prolongs their icu stay which may be detrimental so i believe at the end of it the risk outweighs the benefit uh, with the routine usage of steroids as an adjunct to iv immunoglobulins so iv immunoglobulins definitely is the way to go and a good weaning process and preventing these patients from having infections and uh, facilitating uh, effective weaning with a good uh, sort of a quality benchmarks in icu is the way to move forward and throwing in steroids will possibly cause more harm than any benefit for these patients would be might take on it but i but every uh, listener should possibly review the literature and discuss with your neurology teams and um, and reconcile as to what 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 should be the standard of care so thank you man and all <clears throat>